Uh, oh, thank you, Ron. There's a Gervais uh, uh, Saint. There's a Gervais cheese. I'm not related to any of those things, but I like it. Uh, hmm. So thank you. Warm welcome to everyone. This is the um, kind of, we, we kind of call ourselves the um, agile uh enterprise and, and it's more for like large companies are trying to do this agile transformation thing and and, and how does that work and how how can we learn from it and we invite wonderful guests like the one today and i'll let ron introduce him but uh, i've known larry for a while and he's a wonderful gentleman and he's done some wonderful things to help uh people learn and and help their careers so I welcome him a lot. So now I'm going to turn it over to Ron and have Ron introduce Larry, and then Larry's going to do his thing. So um, back in 2017, so six years ago, this group's been going for more than six years, but six years ago, Larry came to talk to this group back when it was called Gateway to Agile. And we were looking at how do you go from not being agile to 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 maybe doing some Agile, the ideal, the ideal would be actually being Agile. And Larry came to talk to us about uh, BDD uh, and uh, Gherkin and uh, Pickles and things like that. Uh, and, and gave a wonderful, uh, a truly wonderful talk on, um, uh, 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 on BDD and, um, and pointed out that BDD was designed as the gateway to um, TDD, to test-driven development, uh, when test-driven development was too hard, which I didn't know at the time. Uh, and so I thought that was I thought that was pretty darn interesting. Um, he uh, he was uh, God, I don't know who you were working for then, Oracle maybe, Larry. Yeah, I think that was Oracle. Yeah, and I think Oracle brought you up from Phoenix, from Arizona. Uh, I came. I, I was in Scottsdale, Arizona, for 25 years. Yeah, and, uh, I got brought up to the Bay Area for Apple, actually. Uh -huh. uh, I had a contract with Apple, and I fell in love with the Bay Area. And so now it's almost 10 years later. I'm still here. Uh, that's awesome. And and uh, and he worked. He went to work for Splunk as an agile coach, and PG&E as an agile coach, and. Uh, and more recently, yeah. T-Mobile as an agile coach, and uh, but seven years ago started a um, started setting up agile classes for the unemployed. And ha how many how many unemployed people have you trained through the job hackers, Larry? Uh, if you t count single individuals, I I trained over four thousand people worldwide um, during that span. Um, if you count the number of people who've taken the class more than once, um, it's more like 7,000 uh, people who've gone in and out of the doors of uh, a non what, what eventually became a nonprofit we called the Job Hackers. Originally, I was just doing it kind of uh, shooting from the hip, um, but we eventually made it a, an official nonprofit, and uh, it's still still going strong. So uh, if you have anybody who needs, who wants some free Agile and Scrum training, uh, and and is unemployed, and it would be helpful for them. That you can look it up. It's the jobhackers.org. I'm no longer uh, associated with them. Um, I stepped down from the board and from the company in May to to, to see if it would uh, continue to exist without me. That's how you find out. Is you walk away, and um, so far it's so so far so good. Still going. So far so good, and uh, and he's also left T-Mobile, and we've been trying to get him to come talk about agile transformation through organizations and experiences uh, and the expertise he's taken away from those experiences for, I don't know, a couple of years anyway, maybe even three, um, to a, a return engagement to now the enterprise agile global community. So Larry, I'll let you take it from there. I appreciate it, Ron. Um, it's good to see. I see some folks that I know, and, and I see some folks who, who haven't turned on their cameras that I've known for some time. Uh, I see some job hackers, um, people who've gone through my nonprofit uh, and, and learned uh, Agile and Scrum uh, from me sometime in the past. And um, it's great to see you. 
Um, I'm really big on uh, sharing uh, our, our faces. Uh, so it, it helps me uh, with the presentation. So if you can, um, please do. I'm going to start sharing my slides because we all have slides. I'm assuming you can see that now. Um, as I'm, well, Ace and I, you're, you're driving, so man, if you uh, if you want to turn your camera off, I'll, I'll give you a I'll give you a pass on that. Um, I'm, as Ron said, I, I've been doing this for a while. I know a lot of us probably have. I've I've been doing it for about a decade, and I've been teaching it for a while and I've been very fortunate to to work with a bunch of uh, different companies in transformation um, pretty large scale transformations uh, we're talking uh, before we came in here at T-Mobile we did a project to product funding transformation uh, of a billion dollars and we uh, actually accomplished that in seven months I think it's the largest fastest of its kind um, I've learned a few things along the way or at least I think I've learned a few things along the way. Um, I think one of the things we all learn along the way is we learn what doesn't work. Because I think the batting average for all organizational transformation and particularly agile transformations is not really high. Um, I wouldn't want uh, my uh, brain surgeon to have the kind of batting average that a lot of us have, uh, mm -hmm. but we do learn from. And this is this presentation is really a distillation of what I've learned over the years about what I think works. Uh, there are some folks who might say you're crazy, and that's fine. I'm good with that. Um, but I want to present it to you. I think you'll find it interesting. And I'm hoping that you will be able to take some of this, not just in the work that you do in Agile Transformation, um, but also I think there's applicability to all of life. I know that's kind of a broad thing. But I believe that you could take some of the things I'm going to talk about today, you can think about them, and you can say, hey, I can apply this to my life. And I'm in this game, and I think a lot of us are in this game, is because I understand what I, I call the transformative nature of Agile itself, the philosophy, how we have the power as coaches, as scrum masters, product owners, or whatever, people who understand Agile, to make people's lives better. That's what gets me up in the, in the morning. That's what gets me excited about what I do. And I, and I am pretty excited about what I do because we have the ability to change people's lives for the better. And not everybody can say that in their jobs. Um, and I think I've been very fortunate that I've, I've been able to do that. So the, the presentation is called Seeing Your Way to an uh, Effective Agile Transformation. I talk, we talked a, lot, a little bit about myself already, but uh, as, as Ron said, um, I've decided to part ways uh, with T-Mobile. We both decided to part ways. Um, so I am right now uh, on the market, but one of the things I'm doing is I think that the training I've done for seven years, I think I've gotten pretty good at it. And I've seen the effect that it has. I've brought it into the companies I do. I want to bring it into other companies. So I, I've, I've rebranded. I've called it the VUCA MBA. Um, the MBA parts, uh, my wife keeps reminding me, doesn't st stand for Masters of Business Administration. It stands for Mindset for Business Agility. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, happy to speak with anyone. You can go to my, I've got various websites, LarryApke.com. I'm the only Larry Apke who's still alive. So I'm not that hard to find. Um, and a VUCA MBA, and I've got a lot of my training, actually, I've open sourced on YouTube. I want to start with a thought experiment. If, if you guys will indulge me just a little bit here. I want us to kind of, and if it helps you close your eyes, I want us to kind of try to imagine what the world looked like the day before the microscope was invented. Now, for those of you who don't know, it's somewhere in the 1400s. I never remember exact dates. That's why I didn't do well in history in school. I can't remember exact dates, but it's around the 1400s. And I think you can all have a picture of what life looked like in the 1400s. For those of you who have trouble, I'll tell you what it looks like to me. It looks like a, a lot of huts with straw roofs, uh, whatever you call them, thatch roofs. It looks like you know people in kind of dirty clothing and horses running around, maybe a few carriages here and there, and mud streets, that kind of thing, right? But whatever the picture you have in your mind, I want you to just fast forward 24 hours. I want you to fast forward to the day after the microscope was invented. 
And I want to ask you a very simple question. Is a picture changed at all? And if you're like me, and I think a lot of you probably are, the picture has not changed at all. The world as it existed did not change because the microscope was invented. But something fundamentally changed. And that's kind of what this talk is about. Because what fundamentally changed with the invention of the microscope is when we looked at the world before the microscope, we could only see it with our naked eye. Hence the big picture of the naked eye. I don't just put it there to freak you out. And when we looked at a drop of water, it was merely a drop of water, nothing more. And then the microscope comes along and we can see inside that drop of water. Now this is obviously a picture of what you saw under the first microscope, but the world did not change. What changed was our ability to access the world as it existed. So I'm gonna to refer to the world as it exists outside of our senses. I'm gonna to refer to it as objective reality. We all know it exists. We can all catch glimpses of it, but we cannot see it as it is. We can, however, have lenses that help us to see, just like a microscope. Those lenses help us to see what is in objective reality because now we see things like the paramecium, euglena, right? Amoebas. All those things you learn in high school biology, you can see those things. And our world as humans has is opened up and become much, much broader, but the world itself hasn't changed. And because we can start to see these things, what happens is we have now germ theory of disease. And we can understand that there are things that we cannot, that we previously couldn't see that can affect us. They can cause us harm with bacteria and other things, or they, et cetera, et cetera. It's our ability to see the world that's really, really important. And so it's these lenses, I'm gonna to refer to it as lenses, but, but in science, we have a different word for it. We, we call them mental models. It's these lenses that become really, really important to us as human beings. Don't like that one? Let me give you another one. We are just talking about the weather and other things. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio not too far from where uh, Gervais is now. He's in Indianapolis, Indiana. Same weather. I grew up in the suburbs. And when I looked, I spent all my time, us old folks, we used to spend all our time outside. The, the folks would send you out and they say, you come back when the street light comes on. Don't bother me, right? Some of you might remember. And you go outside and it'd be dark. You'd be playing with your friends. You look up in the sky and you're looking for the Big Dipper and the whatever, right? Whatever you could find. And it looks something like this, but I grew up in the suburbs. Many, many years later, it's a long story, so I won't get into it. I found myself in the middle of Idaho and I looked up into the sky and it looked like this. Was it a different sky? No, it's the same sky. My ability to access it and see it differently is what, what changed. And I can tell you when I looked up at the sky in, in, in the middle of nowhere in Idaho and I saw something that looked something like this, I almost didn't believe my eyes. Right? Because it's it's tough to believe that because for, for, for most of my life, I thought it looked, you know, like the first picture. And I found that this is really important to us as human beings. And I want to talk about those lenses and mental models. Um, you can't talk about models without pulling out the old George Box quote. All models are wrong, but some are useful. We as human beings, we create mental models and pictures of the world all the time. We, we, we do it through our senses, through our perception. And sometimes these things are closer to objective reality. And sometimes these things are further away from objective reality. Sometimes we can see what's really there. Sometimes we can't. I believe, by the way, and I think you probably agree with me, that, that if we are to be most successful in life, it helps when our mental models have a high fidelity with objective reality. It helps when we see things clearly. 
because we got a better chance. Now, I'm, I'm a big believer in complexity theory and, and, and VUCA and, and uh, what's the Kinevin, you know, all these things that talk about complexity. Um, there's no guarantee of anything in this complex world. But the thing that we can do when we see things more clearly is we can up the odds. And that's really what it is about transformations and other things for me. It's about upping the odds because not everything's under our control. And when we see things more clearly, I think we can see, we can up those odds. We can, we can, we can uh, get better success. Here's how I see organizational transformation. I put agile in quotes because I think this is any organizational transformation. It's a bit simplistic. So some of you are experts. You might want to take a little bit of umbrage, but it's really simple for me. The way we perceive or see things leads to us thinking in certain ways. The way we think leads to us behaving in certain ways. And the way we behave changes the way we perceive and think. Right? And I think we all get that. That these three things are, are intertwined. I can change the way I see the world. It will change the way I think about it. It will change the way I behave. I can change the way I behave. It may change the way I see the world. It may change the way I think about it, right? These, are, these things are intertwined. Um, so it looks more like this, if we want to be really accurate. Now, I want to ask yourself the question, if so far you agree with me or even slightly agree with me or just want to humor me, if this is true, where do we spend most of our time in organization or agile transformation? We spend it in behavior, right? We spend it in behavior. I have a I have a lot of debates. I, I know I know a lot as as probably you do. A lot of smart agile coaches, and I've had these debates with them. We need to change their behavior. It's going to change the way they see the world. Great. Right? Good luck with that. I think that's, I think when that happens, what happens is we change their behavior because we have some kind of power over them and we can change their behavior. And then when that power is lifted, does the behavior continue to exist? I think if we can get people to actually change the way they see the world, then they will change their behavior. But I think it will stick. And I think that's the difference. Because we were talking about, again, in the green room, if you will, before this started, about how many times are you in an agile transformation? Where are the coaches? Everything's working fine. Coaches leave and everything goes back to where it was before. Because behavior is a tricky thing, right? So this is how I see the world. So, so if, if you're with me so far, good. Because this is what I think we miss. It's not that we don't know it. You're all smart people. You know this stuff, right? This is nothing new but I think we forget it in most transformations. And I think we do so in a way that doesn't allow us to be as successful as we could be. Why is how we perceive things so critical or how we see things so critical? Well, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying this as probably some of you have. And here's the reason or what I think to be the reason. We as humans have evolved in ways that do not allow us to have optimal perception of the world. Yet, and this is the key, we've, been, we've evolved in ways that we're blind to our perception problems. We don't think about it. We have a blindness to our blindness, if you will. We want to believe that what we see is what's there. But time and time again, this is not always true. And science is telling them that. In fact, I can easily show you what I mean, right? Some of you might be from Missouri. You say, show me. These are optical illusions. These are problems with our perception, and they're really, really easy. I got four of, the, of some of the most basic illusions of sight, right? Because we always say seeing is believing, right? You take up the look at the top left. This is one that blows me away. 
we have evolved to see light and shadows in three dimensions, even though we know that we know this is a two dimensional thing, right? It looks three dimensional. It has shadows. So it fools us into three dimensions. I always was fascinated by optical illusions, always fascinated by 3D. I don't know why. It's kind of cool, right? 3D TVs, I bought one. Nobody else did. So I don't get to watch 3D very often. Virtual reality, I love it, right? Fools us. If, if if you were to take and print out, I got a fancy color laser printer because I'm a geek like a lot of you. If I were to take this picture and print it out and cut out B and place it on top of A, they're exactly the same shade and color. But we cannot see it that way. We have not evolved to see it that way. So we think what we see is real. And that's the blindness I'm talking about. The tables on the top right, same exact size. You've seen these before. Same exact size. Again, I can prove it. I can print it out, cut it out. I could get a ruler and measure it. And the measurements would be exactly the same. This is the one thing about perception as well, is that science helps us with perception, doesn't it? You want to figure it out? Measure it. We're not good with things when it comes to relativity. We're good with relativity, but we're not good with absolutes. Let me put it that way. So when we look at that, that orange circle, among big circles, it looks small. And when we look at the orange circle with smaller circles, it appears larger. We can't help but see it that way. That's that's how we evolved. It's, it's part of our operating system up here. It's part of how our brain works. And A and B are the same length, though we can't see it that way. And I could go on and on and on. I was down at the Embarcadero. There's uh, that science place down to Barcadero. I don't know if anybody remembers what the name of it is, but um, they had a bookstore there and they had a whole book this thick. Nothing but optical illusions. I sat there for like an hour and they finally had to kick me out. I love this stuff. Exploratorium? Exploratorium. I knew somebody would have it. This is this is how you get things done in the internet world, by the way. Um, you, you put out the wrong information or, or and, and somebody will correct you, which is great. Um, a lot of times I put out the wrong information. I don't try to, but it happens. Here's the problem with this, though. This is just optical illusions. I mean, we've got other perceptual illusions, but vision is our best system of experience in the world if we're sighted, right? Now, of course, if somebody's blind, it's, it's completely different, but, but let's talk about the majority of the people who are sighted. Vision is our primary and best sense. If you look at our brains and you look at the number of neurons that are given to sight, it is somewhere about 70 to 80%. That is our dominant sense. It is what we're good at. I mean, I showed you what we're bad at when it comes to vision, but I want you to remember this. We're really good at faces. There are people who can remember thousands and thousands of faces. Somebody that you met for one time, you say, I can't remember their name. I can't remember where I met them. I can't remember what, I know them. I've seen them before, right? So vision is a really good sense from an evolutionary perspective. But the problem with evolution is evolution was a very simple algorithm. If you can live long enough to pass your half of you on to the next generation, then half of you will, will exist in the next generation, right? This is sexual reproduction. One of our, hopefully uh, a lot of us enjoy that. But that's what evolution is. We get to pass on traits to the next generation, but it's not evolving to some kind of goal. We're not evolving to perfect vision. We're not evolving. I mean, we don't see infrared or ultraviolet without help, right? Bees can. If we're so easily fooled in what's our best sense, then what do we expect is going to happen when we go into other domains? where we don't have such experience, where we don't have such evolution, um, things like uh, decision-making, right? A, a lot of agile is about decision-making. In fact, I got, a, I got a wonderful story about that. Hopefully I won't forget before we're done. Economic reasoning. This, this is the quote from Dan Ariely. If, uh, some of you might be familiar with Dan Ariely. He's a professor at Duke and he studies behavioral economics. 
And he wrote a couple famous books, one of them being uh, predictably irrational, where in an economic sense, we as human beings are predictably irrational. And in fact, I just noticed on the Peacock Network, which I believe is NBC, they have a show. They have a new detective show where the guy is talking about how human beings are predictably irrational. We weren't built for this. Our perceptions weren't built for this. And they're not really even good for some of the stuff we were built for. So how do we expect this to work? A um, couple quotes. Peter Senge, who I teach in the class, I show a video. Uh, I think Senge is great. He wrote, uh, what is it, uh, Fifth Discipline or, or something like that. I, I got it right. How to the, create a, a knowledge uh, a learning organization. The fifth discipline. Yeah, fifth discipline. I did. I got it right. Okay. I should know after after seven years of teaching, I should probably know something about it. Um, he quotes from uh, Umberto, and, and I just pulled the quote. That's why I say it's Peter Senge paraphrasing Umberto. We don't perceive the world we see. We see the world we perceive. We see the world that our, our senses allow us to perceive. We don't see it as it is. That's a problem. We don't see things as those things are. We see things as we are. This is a problem. Uh, Edgar Schein, we do not think and talk about what we see. We see what we're able to think and talk about. Right? These are all, all pretty famous quotes. Max Planck, when you change the way to look at things, the things you look at change. We're not merely observers of the world. We're not merely cataloging what exists. We're interacting with what exists. And we're doing so through senses that are, I would say are, are rather flawed. How many of you notice, and I think a lot of you probably have, that a lot of what we do and talk about in the agile world is counterintuitive, right? I remember the first time Ron was talking about uh, TDD and BDD. And I, I remember one of the first times I ran across XP and, and they had this big thing on pair programming. And I thought, this is a crock. You got to be kidding me. I'm going to pay two people to do the same thing. I came from a, a business background, accounting background. I said, that's crazy. Right? Counterintuitive. I've got, you know, uh, a good friend of the Agile community, somebody I've worked with uh, over the years, um, who worked with Woody Zool. His name is Llewellyn Falco. Some of you are familiar with Llewellyn. What did they invent? Mob programming. Guess what that does to an accountant's head, right? It's counterintuitive. Why? Because our intuition was built on evolution in the physical world. Our intuition was built on evolution, as, as Snowden would say, in maybe the, the simple world or, or the obvious world, or whatever the hell he's calling that quadrant these days. It's, it wasn't built on the complicated world, and it certainly wasn't built on the world of complexity that we have um, in most of what we're talking about as agile transformations, because agile works well with complexity. But it is certainly counterintuitive. So how do we get people to transition to a world that's counterintuitive if we can't get them to see differently? I don't think we can. And I think this is why so many agile transformations fail. Um, anyway, how many people are familiar with Ignaz Semmelweis and the, and the story? Some of you are, right? For those of you who aren't, and there's probably quite a few of you, if, if I get something wrong, feel free to correct me. You won't, you, won't, you won't offend me on this. We're talking about um, the microscope and, and, and things we couldn't see, germs. Semmelweis was a, a physician in Austria. And this is the beginning of what we might want to call the, the, the science of, of healthcare. And they built hospitals. Because before the hospitals were built, people were taken care of at home or, or you give blood at the barbers and whatever. I don't know what the hell they were doing. But a lot of women would, would give birth at home, midwives. But now we're, we're men of science. It's usually men, by the way. Sorry, I, all I see are men in this, in this room, so, but it's usually men, the men of science. Um, we're going to give birth in a hospital because that, you know, it's barbaric to give birth at home. And so they did. And it was interesting that 
um, a lot of women died in these hospitals giving birth. It wasn't better. And it mattered, believe it or not, which day you showed up to the hospital might have determined whether you're actually going to come out of the hospital alive. And I'm not trying to be flippant about it, but this is true. On certain days, I, I don't know if it was set up this way, but I, I imagine it this way. And it was similar to the, from what I heard in the story. They had two different wings. So you, you go in the front door, you can go left, you can go right. One side was physicians. One side was nurses. And depending on the day of the week, you got either the physician side or the nurse's side. Now, your intuition probably would say that if we, if women were dying in great numbers in the hospital, that more and more more of them would have been dying on the nurse's side. You would have been wrong. More of them were dying when they went to the physician side. And this is very curious. And when we talk about death rates, we're talking about high rates of death. We're talking about 20, 30 percent death rate from what they call purple fever, uh, which is fever during childbirth. And it depended a lot on which day of the week you showed up to the hospital. Life's funny, isn't it? And so it's a head scratcher, right? Why are these women dying? And and here's the, here's the rub. Um, they were men of science. So when a woman died, and I'm assuming because uh, in, in movies and TV shows, the morgue is in the basement. They take them to the basement. They go into the morgue. And what do they do? They perform an autopsy to try to figure out what's going on. And guess what they didn't do before they went back to the deliver more babies? They didn't wash their hands. Right? So here they are performing autopsies, and they're getting these germs all, all over and back then, the doctors wore white, as, as they do. I mean, you wear a white lab coat. There's studies that say people will listen to you. Maybe I should wear a white lab coat when I present. But th that was a thing. And having blood and, and all this stuff on you was like, I'm a doctor. I'm important. So they had all that blood and pus and goo on them, right? All these pathogens. And they go back and deliver babies. And women would die. And it was tragic. And, and Semmel Weiss was one of the physicians there, and he had a good friend of his. Performs an autopsy, nicks his finger, and infects himself. Dies of very similar symptoms than the women. He puts two and two together. He says there must be something. Now, remember, this is before germ theory. There must be something we cannot see that is causing this to happen. We should go wash our hands, something that simple. And so Semmelweis says, hey, look, I've figured it out. There's things that we cannot see. All we got to do is wash our hands. And do you think that they gave him a standing ovation? Do you think they gave him a parade? No, they said, you're crazy. Because that's what we usually do when we don't see things that other people see, right? You're crazy. Fast forward a few years, he finally gets it to a point where he gets some power within this hospital. And he forces the physicians to wash their hands. And guess what happens to the number of deaths? It goes way down, as we would expect. Did they give him a parade? Nope. Still no parade for poor Semmelweis. They drummed him out. And they went back to not washing their hands. And women, the death rate went back up. Now, to me, this is a story about transformation and how we see the world, because he could not convince them that the things we couldn't see were the things that were doing it for many reasons. And I'm sure you can see the parallels in some of the transformations you've been part of. The key is that often we say, well, if we just had smart people and they were physicians. They were the smartest people around at the time. If we just had motivated people, and these people were motivated, right? They were physicians. If, if, if we just had, you know, people who were well compensated for what they do, and these were people who were well compensated, they had every reason to be successful. And they still didn't. It's a very, very sad thing. Semmelweis died in an insane asylum. Um, 
you can you can figure out what the reason was. Because this was an in, insane thing. These people that were there to take care of women to 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 ensure their health were killing them, and they didn't seem to care. There's a lot in that, folks. And here's the problem. We have these perception problems and they lead us to biases. I know most of you, if not all of you are familiar with the term cognitive bias. I have a presentation in my training I call cognitive illusions because I think it's illusionary. It's not just bias. This particular image, for those of you who are interested, comes to us from uh, Buster Benson and John Magnuge in the third. Uh, I have the poster. I, you can buy it. I don't encourage you to buy it. I don't get a commission off of it. It's quite expensive and it's not worth it, but I have it. Someday when I get a real office, I'll, I'll put it up again. It's in a tube somewhere in storage. These are all the biases that the human mind is susceptible to. If you look at the brain in the center and you look at like the leaves off the brain, all those things, that's, a, that's an eye chart. There's 170 plus cognitive biases that science has identified that we as human beings have, and we all have it. No one is immune from it. It is how we are built. It's like it's like saying you have, you know, what what is it, uh, 46 chromosomes, or I got that number right. I should. I was a biology major. You have 46 chromosomes, whatever you got, right? You have two eyes. It's whatever, it's a part of you. And they just put it into these different categories. So in my class, I teach uh, about some of the major categories because um, nobody has time to go into 170 plus cognitive biases. Um, but it's important that we understand these because these are glitches in our operating system. These are things by very definition of a cognitive bias that causes us to do things that are irrational from a, from a sense of pure rationality. We are irrational beings, by the way. We're not rational beings. We're rationalizing beings. That's a different thing. We rationalize what we think, even if it's irrational. You see a lot of parallels in politics. I won't get too much into it. I live in the Bay Area. You probably know what my politics are, so I'll just keep it to myself. But it matters. These biases matter because these are things that do not allow us to see the world as it is. So therefore, I believe that until we address our perception problems, our organizational transformations are doomed to fail. And I believe this because I've seen it, not because it's something that I want to be true. I think it'd be nice if we could just say, we're gonna install Jira and here's how you use Jira and you're all done. Thank you, give me my big paycheck and I'm gonna walk off. That would be a lot more fun. It'd be a lot more satisfying, but it's not true. I believe that we have to get to a critical mass of people within an organization that see the world that we see. I think this is one of the things that we miss as agile coaches. We see the world in certain ways and we take that for granted. It's called the curse of knowledge. Because we see the world in certain ways, just like I live in the Bay Area and I assume everybody works in IT. We see the world in certain ways. We assume that everyone else sees the world that way. So we just go about changing their behavior and not changing the way they see the world. In fact, I think that this is the key for anything, by the way. And I'm making that argument right now. I'm trying to change the way that you see what you do. Um, I wrote a blog post many, many years ago, and I still believe this to be true, is if you want to change the world, the very first thing you have to change to change the world is you have to change the way you perceive the world. And how do I know this? Well, we got a name for people that change the world. I don't like to get too much political or or, uh, or religious, but Jesus Christ. How did he change the world? What do we call people like that? What do we call Buddha? What do we call uh, Steve Jobs? What do we call Elon Musk? Though he's not, I'm not a Musk fan. But what do we call these people? We call them visionaries. Why do we call them visionaries? Because they see the world differently than us. Now, for a visionary to be successful, and you are visionaries as agile coaches, you see the world differently than other people. For us as visionaries to be successful, our next thing is we got to get people to see the world that we see. 
and then we can become successful. Until we do that, we can only change behavior, and the only way we can do that is metaphorically with a gun. Right? We'll do it metaphorically with a gun. You do this or you lose your job. But what we're saying, when we just try to change the behavior without changing the thinking and the, and the perception. How do we change people's view of the world by changing what we focus on. Think about the, the concept of a lens, right? I gave you two examples. If, if, if we use a microscope, we can see through a lens things we cannot see, things that are small. If we use a telescope, we go the other direction. Again, the heavens didn't change when we got the telescope, guys, right? They were always there. We just couldn't see them before. And when we got the telescope, it changed a lot of things. It changed religion. Because in religion, we said that Earth was a center of the universe. <clears throat> because we couldn't see anything else. We couldn't figure out anything else. When we saw better, we'd know what it was. So what do we change? We change what we focus on. It's the focus that matters. And science tells us you can only focus one thing at a time. And I, I, if we got any young folks out there who think you can multitask, forget about it. You can't. You can only focus on one thing at a time. We have to be very, very vigilant about what we focus on. How do we change the focus? Well, in organizations, we change the incentives. The incentives determine what people will focus on. There's an old saying, what gets incentivized gets done. You've heard that before, I'm sure. I think I've invented a better one, or I maybe read it somewhere, because I read a lot, and then I forget I read it, and then I think I invented it, and then I go back, and it's like, no, you didn't invent it, dummy. Right? Have you ever had that happen? So if you read it somewhere else, I probably did too. If not, you can give it to me. Throw me a bone, people. What gets incentivized gets focus. We need to change the focus. And the way we change the focus is we change the incentives. As I was talking in the green room with Gervais, we were talking about this transition from a project financed system, accounting system, to a product accounting system. Why does that make a big difference? Because it changes what we focus on. It changes the incentives. Why does this work? There's my phrase. I think I invented it. Maybe I did. The power of focus and incentives, we all know, because uh, Upton Sinclair said, uh, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. You can get people to do a lot of things behaviorally if you tell them their job depends on it, right? We know that. You'd get people, I mean, motivation and, and incentives really easy. Take a gun with you somewhere. Point, point it to somebody's head. See if you can get them to do what you want them to do. Right? That's not how we should do our transformation, but it would be pretty effective in the short run. To a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Because we can only talk about what we perceive. So how do we do this? I'll give you another clue. Metaphors are the key. Metaphors are the key. We use metaphors as a bridge between what my perception is, well, scratch that, let's go the other way. What your perception is and what mine is, it's the bridge. So when I do a, a lot of my talks and what do I do? I use metaphors. We used a bunch of them at the beginning. We used a telescope and a microscope. Why? Because it, it takes something that you know, that you perceive, and it brings you to something that I perceive. And metaphors are powerful. Um, uh, one of the things that, that, that's very interesting is uh, some of you know that I have a couple books. They're not great books. If you want to buy them, that's okay. It's, it doesn't make that much difference in, in my pocketbook, but if you're interested, you can. They're on Amazon. Um, I was working on my third book. It had been, I didn't realize it had been like nine years since my second book. It took me that long to get over the fact that it didn't sell. 
The first one sells a little bit. The second one doesn't sell at all. Um, I started writing a book, and that's going to be one of my books coming up. It's Agile Metaphors. So don't take it. Don't, don't beat me to the punch. Um, along the uh, along on the trip along the way to writing the Agile Metaphors book, I actually ended up writing another book. Um, but I was also trying to write a different book, but I ended up writing a, a completely different book. So I, uh, I had my third book will be coming out in uh, mid-October if everything works out all right. And it's it's called the, uh, something we can talk about later maybe is is the uh, uh, AppKey's Golden Rule of Agile. If you want to talk about it afterwards in Q&A, I'd be happy to, to speak about it. Anyway, <clears throat> metaphors of the bridge. We have to be able to get people to see what we see. And metaphors are how you're going to do it. Uh, it's not that different than if I look at, um, I'm assuming most of us are, are familiar with the, the Christian tradition. I'm not picking a religion. I, I have mine. It's it's not uh, not the Christian one. Uh, it's it's none of the above, um, which makes me uh, about as uh, uh, people as happy with me and trustworthy as a used car salesman. But that's my religious choice. Um, but I know the Christian tradition. And what did Jesus speak in? He spoke in parables. What are parables other than metaphors? A way to bridge the way you see the world with the way I see the world. It's how all the visionaries have done it. Think about the speeches of Martin Luther King. I have a dream. He talks about going to the mountain. These are all metaphors. It's a way of getting you to see what I see based on what you see currently. I want to talk about a couple other things I found along the way, which are kind of funny. I want to talk about the aha and the duh response. The aha response is what I'm looking for in my training. Uh, it's what I'm looking for from this particular talk. I'm hoping I'm getting some of that. Aha response is I see something that I didn't see before. And the classic example being the Grinch who stole Christmas. I think you're all familiar with the story. He steals all the presents and he's gloating up the top of the hill and he thinks that they're going to be crying and that's going to be music to his ears. But what do they do? They're singing. And why are they singing? Because that is the true meaning of Christmas. And he missed it. He didn't see it the way they saw it. But then he does. Aha! And what happens? His heart grows three times its size. I won't say that your heart is going to grow three times its size. That wouldn't be very medically good for us. But I think you're going to get some aha out of this. And I, I think people get aha out of my class and, the, and the, the way I teach things, because it really is about getting people to see things that they haven't seen before. And we've all had those aha moments where we see something that we didn't see before and the world makes sense. It makes more sense. We see things more clearly. That is the role for me, and, and, and from now till until I decide to retire, that I play in the world, is to help people see these things differently, which is why I've created my training and which is why I'm trying to market my training, um, because I think it's very important for people to do. And I think these, these aha moments are what really makes for a successful transformation. There's also the duh response. Um, I, I remember I, the old commercial, I could have had a V8. It's, it's um, oh, by the way, uh, oh, I have some examples in a second uh, of both of those in, in um, my particular uh, context. But it's a way of seeing reality that we kind of forgotten. I think a lot of, there may be some aha moments in this, this presentation, but there might be a lot of duh moments. Right. I may leave and you're, you'll say, hey, you know, he's kind of cute and fun and we had a good time. He was entertaining, but uh, I already knew this stuff. The dumb response is you knew it, but you kind of forgot about it. Right. You didn't pay enough attention to it. Um, I think that's an important one, too, because, again, it goes back to this curse of knowledge. We just assume that everybody knows what we do. Sometimes you got to really bring it down and say, do you, do you really see this? Because this is what I'm seeing, right? So it's things we've overlooked. The aha example for me was Kinevin. 
I'm not, I'm not going to say it's perfect. And I know that there's a lot of problems in and people argue back and forth the complexity and complicated, all this other stuff, but it, it, it triggered an aha response for me because what it allowed me to do is it allowed me to see the world a little bit differently. And it explained a lot of things that I saw in the world, which was there is a fundamentally uh, different nature to software development. And I, and I, in my class, I talk about all knowledge work than there is physical work. There's a fundamental difference between somebody who writes software uh, for a living, who creates software products, and the people who build this wonderful apartment complex behind them. And Kenevin helped me to see that. It also started pulling other things in. Like, like we know, science tells us that People who are knowledge workers are motivated completely different than people who are not knowledge workers. This is uh, drive Dan Payne, right? But a lot of people just don't know that. I mean, I spend I spend time talking about. Um, if, if you're familiar with the, in the class, I talk about. Um, uh, shoot, I can't think of the, the, the word now. This is what happens when you get older. Um, I talk about drive, and I talk about people work. Because we've known for some time that people who are in knowledge work are motivated differently. And if we continue to try to motivate people in knowledge work the same way we motivate people outside of knowledge work, we're not going to get optimal results. And that's another thing I talk a lot about, by the way, is you'll hear me use the word optimal. It's not good, bad, right, wrong. We tend to be dichotomous in our thinking, but the world isn't dichotomous. We make it dichotomous. What I'm looking for is I'm looking for optimization. I'm looking, as I said before, to up the odds of success but there's no guarantee. So that's the aha example. The duh example um, came to me when I was working uh, with T-Mobile with and I was heading up to the mothership up there in uh, uh, Seattle area, Bellevue, Washington. I was on the plane and I started reading a book. Uh, it was by Stephen Bungay. It's called The Art of Action. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. If you're not, it's a wonderful book. It talks about mission, mission command in the military. Um, what we uh, there's a term for it in in business. It's it's, uh, but I can't think of it on top of my head. But I'm reading this book, and what he's talking about is he's talking about how we make decisions in organization. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, this thing that we're doing, we we did this thing at at T-Mobile. Um, we didn't call it an agile transformation. Um, some of you, I don't know if some of you heard this before, but we called it R2D2, which stands for Rapid Realization of Value. And dynamic delivery, R2D2, good branding, right? Easily remember. Um, and so here I am uh, trying to help this transformation, uh, uh, R2D2. I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. This R2D2, this thing that we've created, which was basically a, a, a customized scaling framework. It wasn't safe. It wasn't less. It was, it was something that we built our own. Um, and I talk a little bit about that during Q&A too. Um, it was a decisioning framework. Who gets to make the decisions about the work? Where do they happen? Who gets the money to make those decisions, et cetera, et cetera, because it was very heavily financial because we're moving from project to product. And I think to myself, wait a minute, this is a decisioning framework is what we're creating, but we haven't explained it that way. So I go to my, my friend, and the person who brought me into T-Mobile was uh, at the time, uh, we both actually are no longer part of T-Mobile, but he was a chief digital officer. He brought me in to help um, up on the top floor, you can imagine, at, at T-Mobile offices. And I go up to the top floor very early in the morning, hoping I can catch him because I was so excited to tell him this. Uh, his name is Marcus. And I said, and he happened to show up early in the morning so I could spend some time with him. And I sat down with him, I said, Marcus, I'm kicking myself in the head because I'm on the plane. I'm reading this book and, and it's all about this, that, the blah, blah, blah. Here's, here's what I, here's what I want to tell you. R2D2 is a decisioning framework among other things. And Marcus looked at me and he said, duh. Basically, he didn't say that. He's more polite than that. Plus he's British. So he would have done it with a British accent, but he said basically that, of course it is. And I said, but here's the problem, Marcus. It's obvious to you and me. It's not obvious to everyone. 
So that was the duh response. And I think that's something as coaches we have to pay attention to. The things that are obvious to us are obvious because we see them. But they're not obvious to everybody else. Trust me. Because when we started talking about as, as a decisioning framework, we didn't get a lot of duh response. We got a lot of aha response. Right? Because people didn't see it that way. It was new to them to even conceive of something like that. I got a couple more stories and then we'll take some questions. I think I'm doing pretty good on time as I, if I look at it. I figured I'd do about an hour. So I got laid off on a Friday and as fate would have it, I uh, went to Mexico on Saturday. It was already planned. So I took a trip down to Cabo. And like most people on vacation, we read books. Um, some people read mystery novels and other things. I read agile books or agile-esque books. Um, I was reading a book, some of you might be familiar with, called Moonwalking with Einstein. And if you're not, it's an interesting book. Um, uh, the author, Joshua Four, he uh, basically studied people who did memorization. And they have like these mental memorization Olympics and stuff. And he became a champion. Um, there's certain tricks and techniques that you can use. But along his journeys, he, he, he had some stories. I thought, man, this is great. I'm going to include it in this talk. So this is new. It wasn't in the original talk. They talk about the best SWAT team members. And what they found when they studied the SWAT team members, some of you are familiar with uh, Anders Ericsson. He's a professor of psychology at Florida State University. He's the one who told us that it takes about 10,000 hours of, of concentrated study to become an expert in things, right? It has to be directed and, and concentrated. Uh, my dog wants to get in on the act here. You, can you hear my dog or is it just me? Okay, well, we're going to have to power through this because I don't know where the rest of the family She's just is. helping you teach the class, that's all. <laughs> you, you, work, you never know what you're going to get. Um, they found that the best SWAT people just saw the world differently than the others. They would see things that other people didn't see, but they saw it reflect uh, reflexively. They saw it as instinct. This is one of the things about gut feel. Um, when you become an expert in something, your gut will tell you something. I often tell uh, C-level people that I get a chance to talk with that actually listen to me, which is not that many, but I, I usually tell them if I had one piece of advice I'd give you is don't trust your instinct because the complex world is counterintuitive and your intuition is what builds your instinct. But my intuition is different and I would assume that yours is as well. If you're an agile coach, you've been doing it as long as I have, you've got well more than 10,000 hours, you spend your life obsessed with it. You start to see things that other people don't see. Sometimes without even being conscious that you're seeing them. And this is what they found with these best SWAT team members. Experts see the world differently. They notice things that non-experts don't see. They hone in on the information that matters most and have almost an automatic sense of what to do with it. You are that way as an agile coach. You will go into a situation and you will know there's something wrong before you know what's wrong because that's what experts do. That's not what lay people do. That's why it's really important that we don't confuse what we see with what other people see. They don't see the world that way. There's another one, which I thought was a much more interesting story, which I'm gonna call the curious job of the chicken sexer. Back in the old days, I don't know if you know much about chickens. I don't know much about it. Anybody know much about chickens? Male chickens, pretty much worthless. Don't lay eggs. Meat's not that good. You don't want them around, right? Basically, the male chicken, if, if a male chicken is born, you want to find out as quickly as possible, and you're basically going to, it's dog food, whatever. I don't know. But there was a problem way back in the 1900s that, when, the, when a chicken was born, they couldn't tell if it was a male or female for quite some time. It took weeks. And in the meantime, they had to feed it until they found out it was a male and then they get rid of it. 
So it would make a lot of sense if they could figure out as a male sooner. So what they did is that there was actually these people that figured it out. There was something to do with like a little indentation or something in, in the chicken's behind. It was in the 1920s. And once they figured this, they started teaching it to people because it was very valuable. These chicken sexers made a lot of money. Um, but what happened, which was interesting, is they had a school. I have to read this because I won't read it. It's a Zen Nippon school in Japan, which was a chicken sexing school, whose standards were so rigorous that only 5 to 10% of the students actually received accreditation. But those who did made a lot of money because they could take a newly born chicken. They could say, this one's a male and this one's a female, thereby saving the people who would have to raise the male a lot of money. So these chicken sexers were in quite demand. But what he has to say about the chicken sexing is the interesting part. Because even the best chicken sexers weren't able to deter weren't able to describe what they did. They just knew it. In some fund fundamental sense, the expert chicken sexer perceives the world, sees the world in a way that is completely different from you or me. And I would posit to say um, that we don't have a whole lot in common with chicken sexers, but we as agile coaches see the world in ways that most people do not. And I believe until we can get people to see what we see, um, I don't think any real transformation that is going to last is really gonna happen. Um, there, there's one more problem with that as well, especially in most hierarchical organizations. Um, and this is one of the, the other book that was, I'm going to write. So there's there's two books I have, and I got three books I'm trying to write. One of them is actually going to come out, which is Apke's Laws of Agile Transformation. And one of those is you can get it right with 99 people, but if you get it wrong with that one person, it can blow the whole thing. So we've got to get a critical mass of people, especially in leadership, to see the world that we see or we won't be effective. Uh, I believe so much to be true that I'm betting on it because that's what I'm going to do with my life from now on is to try to get people to see the agile world that we see. <clears throat> and that's all I had, but I do have time for questions. Cool. I, Thank I would assume somebody's got a question. Well, Larry, I was going to say, uh, go ahead. There's not that many uh, people here now. So just unmute yourself <laughs> and ask Larry a question because he will respond. <laughs> I, I will. I will respond for sure. And if you want to be called on, you can in the reactions. Um, where is it? In the raise, in the raise hand, you can raise your hand. I'll lower my hand now. Joseph. Yes, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I am so delighted to uh, listen to you, uh, Larry. I met you a number of times, but never had the privilege to closely listen to you. Normally, I'm not coming to these events because of the times that I'm on the Eastern east uh, side of the country so these events are pretty late and i have two small kids but today i made special arrangements to listen to you uh, i think what you presented is uh, i think it's a profound uh, presentation i love this combination of uh, like thoughts quotes and completely coming from a different angle towards the organization or enterprises. Uh, I think lots of gems were really shared with us. And uh, I can imagine that probably a result for offspring of maybe a decade of reading <laughs> was presented in a very accessible way. Uh, so I do not have a question other than uh, just to say thank you 
Uh, but uh, because the reason I don't have a question is that I would love to sit with you one on one, which I just scheduled. Like when you were representing, uh, I I did a bit uh, multitasking, so I set a one on one meeting for us, and it's tomorrow. Okay. Uh, what I would like to say is that uh, I agree. Until our paradigm is not shifted our understanding of organization and enterprise uh, will be probably uh, a bit distorted. And if our understanding of organization or enterprise is distorted, most likely that transformations that we apply will be also on distorted perception of the enterprise. Mm -hmm. In order to avoid that distortion or in order to avoid that uh, uh, defectful um, perception of the enterprise. We need to have, I love that those lenses you um, put the image. We have to have the right paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, the right paradigm that takes us to the essence of what is this enterprise that we want to come and transform. Fine, we call ourselves Enterprise Agile Coach or Enterprise Agile Transformation. That's fine, perfectly. I have no objection. We can call ourselves. And But the moment that you call that I am coming to transform this enterprise, then question number one is, do you really understand that very object that you want to transform, right? If you don't understand this object, how would you transform it? Like imagine if a mechanic comes to you and says that I want to turn your car into hybrid. Hybrid is a good instead of fuel. But you ask, do you have knowledge of the car? Do you know how this car is constructed? Say, no, I don't have. Probably you will not trust such a mechanic. So the same is for this enterprise. If you want to transform an enterprise and organization, then you should have a right understanding of it. For that right understanding, do you have, like you said, Lens, I Again, that's the same thing. Do you mm -hmm. have the right paradigm yep. to basically X-ray? And another thing that I also loved in your presentation, can you get an objective image of this enterprise that your image and my image will be not completely different? It's not like subjective understanding, but this is objective understanding of that. Like, for example, if you X-ray my body, you will get an objective X-ray of my body. But to the, to the other side, if a physician uh, just describes him as my situation, it might be subjective. Maybe one physician is more expert, another physician is less expert. Maybe a novice will be less expert. I think these are fundamental uh, notions that you just shared uh, in a very easy, but this, so just thought I will. Well, I think, that, I think that's why, um... You know, some of the things that come to mind from what you said is we tend to do these to others. We're going to transform you as if that's even possible. I, I don't think you can transform somebody without the consent of the person being transformed. Um, and I think we we make a lot of assumptions about what's going on. And I've been subject to doing that as well. It's, it's part, again, I think for me, it's part of the human condition. I think that the reason that I teach what I teach is I want people to realize that this is part of the human condition so that maybe we can do better, right? I'll give you an example. We're all tribal. We like people generally who look like us, right? Who share certain characteristics, which is the way we are. doesn't mean we can't overcome it, right? Um, there's a lot of things that we have in our biases that we can overcome. It just, it takes effort upon our part to recognize that it is a bias, that we have it, and that there are things that we can do, right? One of them is to look for objective measures as opposed to just feels. Um, I am on the fence. You brought up something in my mind. I hope, hopefully you'll give me a leave to talk about just briefly. I've been part of so many transformations that did not achieve what I wanted them to achieve as, as, as an agile coach. And I've seen some disasters and I'm sure we've all seen um, where I've been at places where it was their sixth, seventh try at, at becoming agile and they still can't do it. I'm almost a, of, a, of a mind that it's almost impossible at this point in time to take a large enterprise uh, agile, at least in the way that I would want to see them be agile. Um, 
the thing that I've told a lot of organizations is create a second organization that is agile from the start and continue to pull from the previous organization. Um, I gave a talk. I, I have a, a short little doodly video, you know, whiteboard animation about a talk I gave in Kazakhstan uh, to a bunch of bankers. And <clears throat> I don't speak Russian or anything, but they asked me two questions at the end. And one of them is, how do we take this bank agile? And I said, I don't think you do. I don't <laughs> think you do. I think what you do is you create a whole new organization and you pull over funding, you pull over people, you create that organization, you keep pull, pulling in more and more work to that organization until the, to the previous organization um, continues and does what it's good at, but you're not good at knowledge work. Uh, so you need to create a knowledge work organization. It's much easier that way. Yeah. Um, I would say, look, the, you do here. Here's what I'll do. I'll create the new organization. In fact, that's what I wanted to do in my previous job. I'll create the new organization. You guys keep trying to change the enterprise. Maybe we'll meet in the middle. I think I'll get there faster. Yeah, and that's know. yeah, and that's that's Craig Larman's approach too, and many others to that parallel organization. But hey, Raul, gosh, yeah. I haven't seen you in a while. And then yeah, thank you, Doug. Doug, you 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 you're going next. You put your hand down, but Raul, go ahead. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, this is Raul Neri. So I'm a Scrum practitioner. Uh, practitioner. But uh, Larry, thank you for uh, sharing about the what you pursue and what exactly what um, reality is. But I have a question. I see normally the transformations fails uh, in the in run, but once the once in the transformation, it is in the fail mode and somebody brought in two as a scrum master into the system. And uh, how we can identify what level or how much hierarchy we should go through? Um, because we do see some failure in the team level, but at the same time, it is not only the team's fault. Uh, most of the time, maybe it is coming from the direction from the hierarchy where it is coming. So how fast, how much we can do that way and what is that we, what the suggestion you can give? Well, my suggestion first is take care of yourself. Don't do anything that's gonna, unless you're comfortable with it. I, I tend to be the kind who, 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 who uh, says what comes to mind, um, much to the chagrin of people who've employed me in the past. <laughs> um, I think you have to first determine from your standpoint you know, we all talk about psychological safety and all this. Yeah. How much of the boat do on a rock? Because you're going to have to. I mean, when you look at, like, what is it, the 90, 96.4 or 94.6 rule, uh, Deming talks about, you know, 94% of the problems are systemic in nature. The people who own the system are the people who make decisions in the system. Um, the people who make decisions in the system tend to be further up the hierarchy than where you're working. Um, you have to determine how comfortable you are with challenging the existing system. Um, but if you are going to challenge the existing system, you better damn sure make sure that you're challenging it in a way that's going to be accepted by the existing system, which is where a lot of politics come in. Um, I think the job of a coach and, and a scrum master is a lot more political than people want it to be. Uh, I'm not good at it. Um, I wish I were better at it. But you need to come in to a, a discussion with somebody uh, that is a higher position hierarchically. you got to come into a position, I'm here to help. This is what we're seeing. This is what I think we should do. And then realize that it's not your decision to make. I mean, I've been a consultant back and forth throughout my life you get used to it as a consultant but a lot of people don't that you just really don't have any authority or power you're there to provide best counsel um, and I think your job as a scrum master is to make the, the world as best you can for the, the teams that you have influence for and if that means that you have to go up to the next level you have to ask yourself am I comfortable doing it yes okay what message am I going to take let me take a message of, I'm here to help. I'm not here to challenge you. I'm not challenging your authority. I need your help. What can we do, right? And, and, and the, the, the interesting thing about it 
is a lot of people when they make decisions, they assume that the decision is like, I made this decision and it's going to last for like the next 5,000 years. Come with an idea of something. Can we try this for the next two weeks? That kind of thing, you know, non-threatening to the person's power because you, you still got a job to do. Right or wrong, the person might be a freaking idiot, right? It doesn't matter. You got a job to do. So you're going to have to figure out. To, I mean, that's that's part of why I, I tell my son this all the time. He's 17 and I've got, you know, kids that are 26 and 28 and 32. I tell them all the time. You're going to work with people who are idiots. You're going to work with people who are assholes. Um, figure it out. But come in with, uh, you know, I want to help. And and here's what I here's what I suggest we do. And the, these are the, give them the reasons why, for gosh sakes, you know. What am I going to make their teeth whiter? You're going to make more money for them. You're going to make them taller. I, I have no idea. Give them something that works that, that makes them look better. Thank you. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, it makes it's, sense. It's a, tough situ, it's a tough situation, but first take care of you. It's, yeah, it's a tough. Okay. World. I just got laid off. It's a tough world out there. Try not to get laid off. That's yeah. I mean. How long you can continue? Because if you know it is not correct, but. Uh, we were not able to do something or we not able to achieve what we try to do it, then maybe at some point we should Always keep it. your resume updated would be my advice to anyone at any point in time. You have to decide what you can take and what you're willing to take. But, uh, you know, life is, uh, I, I became, I always said this, uh, you know, I became a parent very late in life. And being a scrum master to me is a lot like being a parent. I became a better scrum master when I became a parent. Because your success is the success of the team. And as a parent, you take a lot of crap. Right? Because your concern is not necessarily you. Your concern is your team. But personally, you got to decide how much crap you're going to take. And if you say, hey, it's too much, good. Move on. But don't move on until you got the job. Don't just quit. Take care of yourself first. It, it is. It, it's a terror. It, it, it's going to get better, but it's it's not a great time to be looking for work. Yeah. So important thing is interpersonal relationships. Yeah. With the individuals in your organization. Yeah. Make friends with people that have power. So it helps. It helps to, it helps to go to lunch with. Them. I used to <laughs> right. I used to just yeah. say, back in the old days when you could do this, I just take them to lunch. I said, what do you want to talk about? I don't want to talk about anything but work. Right. I don't want to talk about what's going on. I don't want to talk about work. Right. Hey, how are you doing? Hmm. You know, you got any kids? What, you know, find that, find out who they are as people. When they see you as a person, it's tougher for them to be an asshole to you. Right. And Doug, do you have a question? Because I know... Oh. Oh, no, I just wanted to say, Larry, I think I attended one of your talks a long time ago. Um, I just want to say I really, really enjoyed it. It was it was a very, um, uh, it, there was a couple of aha moments in it. Um, um, th there's two things that you mentioned about the difficulty in getting, I guess maybe I do have a question, in getting people to see the world like you see it. Um, it because I, I knew like and I'm not a certified scrum trainer, but I've done training and I have people, you know, nodding and understanding and then they leave the room and it's, then they go back to seeing, it's almost like a social thing um, where, where, where depending upon who they are or with, they see the world differently then. And I was just curious, uh, how have you seen, um, how, how do you, how do you tackle that? Cause it's almost like, I don't know if it's a culture thing, a, a social thing, or uh, a power thing, or what. But it's really, really easy for people who, I guess, haven't drunk the Kool Aid, to quickly shift over. Well, I, I think I think part of that is is the the incentives in the system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really make them snap back, but but you have they haven't changed the way they see the world. I, I believe this to be true. So one, either if somebody says, "Oh, you helped me see the world differently." I'll take it with a grain of salt. I mean, if I did, if I didn't, great. It doesn't matter. I, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. That's that's how I feel about what I do. I think it's a luxury. I, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. You take it or leave it. Um, 
but if I've truly gotten to someone, it's not, it's not going to change. It, they may behave certain ways because of incentives. It's not going to stop them from seeing the world. Once you see the world differently, you can't go back unless you have amnesia or, or, or you just have, you know, like me, old timers disease or something, but you, you just, you just can't. It's uh, I, I was an English major. So every once in a while I get to bring out fancy English major stuff. Wordsworth. He wrote a bunch of poems, songs of innocence and experience. Innocence is great, but it's also something where you can be taken advantage of if you're innocent. Once you pierce that veil of experience, you can't go back the other way. I believe it's the same with, with seeing the world differently. Once you see the world differently, you can't not see the world differently. You can actively try to not see the world differently. You may be able to delude yourself into not seeing the world differently. You may behave in ways that doesn't show that you see the world differently, but I don't think internally your brain is going to change. I think you're going to see the world differently once you see it differently. I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's some evidence for it, but that's just my thinking. What here, Here's what I found, and the reason that this became very prominent to me. Now, obviously, I've been doing this training about seeing the world differently for a very long time. But when I brought it into various organizations, and this most recent one, which I might as well name as T-Mobile, I brought in my training, and I trained thousands of people. So I have a high number of people that I've trained within T-Mobile, um, which, believe it or not, it's a huge organization, so it's still just a drop in the bucket. When I went into meetings, and we had big meetings about transformation, big program, all this stuff, I knew the people who took my training, not because I knew them. I could tell by the way they asked questions. Mm -hmm. And when we we would do big organizational trainings where you had 5,000 people show up and people would ask questions, I knew which people took my training by the questions they asked, invariably. So I sat down, I, I hired um, 11 of some of the best Agile coaches in, in the country as contractors. I sat down with the Agile coaches. I said, this is what I believe. Have you seen this? And, and one of them said, I can tell the people you taught because they're easier to coach. So I think once people see the world differently, they're going to see the world differently. Um, the hard part is to get them in the room sometimes and, and especially get the right people in the room. But I think if I can get the right people in the room, I, I, I think I'm pretty good at getting them to see differently. And I think it's, I, I think it's important. I think they get value out of it. Um, and, and you can tell the difference in the transformation because you can tell the people who took my training versus the people who didn't take my training because the people who took my training are easier to work with. Just that simple. Thank you. I said, hey, Jennifer, hi. Hey, Larry, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Good, good. So I actually have a question. And so funny enough, we were at T-Mobile for a brief spent, um, time together. Um, and actually, our team was going through a lot of transformation. And they had a lot of great things to say about the information that you had provided them. And um, I think we made some really great changes. Um, um, based upon the um, direction and guidance that you'd given them, um, you know, um, you know, especially with someone who is in a position as a project manager. At that time, I went from technical delivery lead to being a team lead, and um, I found that, and this is where I would like to get your insight on, because I have a, I have a pretty optimistic view on things, especially as much as I believe in agile is transformation, I, I think we um, we are excited and we want things to happen fast, but um, I think sometimes I find that um, one, if we can do it in bite-sized consumable pieces, mm -hmm. and um, two, um, if, you know, one of the approaches that I take um, in past projects is, so, um, okay, it's not working this way. Let's just try this little bit for X amount of time. What are your thoughts if, you know, as far as when you're looking to implement trans um, transformation, you can even use T-Mobile as an example, because I think from what I saw when I left that they were headed in that direction. And it may not have been in a broad scale with a great impact we were hoping for, but um, I did see some shifts and some progress. So I don't know, maybe you have some insights based upon your being there after I left or something. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I, 
it's easy to Monday morning quarterback anything. So I could talk about some of the mistakes that, that, that were made, some of the mistakes that I made and et cetera, but you only know their mistakes in retrospect anyway. Um, I think one of the things that I would have done differently, and, and in fact, I advise this, but I, I, I don't always win arguments. Um, in fact, if it's my wife on the other side, I never win arguments, but um, I wanted to do things smaller. Okay. I, wanted to, I wanted to start with a particular area and, and really, really dive deep on that area and really yeah. have a, a greater percentage of the people in the mindset, as, as I would refer to it, mm -hmm. and be able to concentrate on that area. There were certain decisions of, that made it much larger transformation than I wanted. It, that yeah, I, that they were looking to move fast and big. Um, and, and, and some of that actually surprised me. So when we talk about this transformation from project funding to product funding, um, this is something that I identified early on as one of the incentives that we needed to change in the system. Um, if you're not familiar with that argument, uh, a project is like a rental car. And so if you're building software products, uh, you tend to, to get a whole bunch of quality issues, technical debt issues, et cetera, et cetera, when you treat products like projects. Um, so I wanted us to treat our software products like products. Um, it made sense. But then you got to change the funding in order to do that. Um, we actually, I didn't do it, but there's some of us, uh, some, of, some of the group went down to North Carolina to an insurance company that's doing the same thing. And we were hoping to get some learnings from them. Um, what we learned from them is it took, they've been doing it for seven years and they're still not done. We got it done in seven months. Um, probably because we were, we were probably a little bit too naive and stupid. Uh, I probably wouldn't have done that either. I would have probably started with changing the funding for a part of the organization instead of basically the, the entire software development spend, which is a billion, about a billion dollars. That's a lot of money. So, so with that thought, because this is what I'm kind of hearing a little bit. Um, so the other thing a approach I take is like, let's identify the win and we can build on the win. What would you say was the win that, you know, you saw out of that, ex out of that direction? I, I think the win, the win on that particular one, um, even though I wouldn't do it and, and Gervais and I will probably talk about this offline because I, I know he's interested in this, this very topic was the fact that we burned the ships was actually a big deal. I'm sorry, say that again? Well, there's an old story about, I, I forget what it was, uh, one of the uh, Italian or, or Spanish explorers, when they came to the new world, they burned the ships. So you couldn't go home. Mm. And that that's what I said when we did this financial thing. I said, man, we just burned the ships. We had no way of going back. We had no back plan. We had no plan B. It was It was move forward or die. There's some advantages to move forward and die. It's probably what I wouldn't have done. You know, somebody came to me and said, "Do this." I would have said, "You're crazy," but we did, and I think that will last. So I think that the long-term incentives in, in in the work that I was able to do while I was there, I think there's some really solid things in place. But going back to this particular presentation, why it's near and dear to my heart, I didn't get to enough people. Uh, what I would consider a critical mass of people with how they see the world in order for it to be wildly successful. Um, there's pockets of success as you would expect in any transformation. I expect that the incentives are better aligned. So hopefully that will over a long period of time set them up in the right direction. Um, but I, you know, the other thing is, is you do that one big thing as most people do, and they tend to chain things and they do projects. And so you do the, you know, like a Gantt chart, I do this and I'm going to do the next one. You got to do a lot of other things too. And we got the big thing, right? We didn't, we, what we didn't get right was agility itself. Hmm. Agility is the ability to, to, to make adjustments based on your environment quickly and successfully. We made one big change quickly and rather successfully. We didn't make the other one. So we really weren't agile in the sense of, of agility. And, and again, the mindset, the mindset was, wow, we, we conquered this project or program. That's not what you want. Gotcha. 
Right. No, that's great. That's great. That that really, I mean, again, being in that situation, um, that really helps to tie things in. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, I don't advise most people would do things as large as we, we tried to do them, but I, I got to admit that I was surprised on that particular one. So maybe with fine, maybe with incentives like finance and project product spending, that's the way to go. Um, or we just got lucky or whatever, who knows? I mean, it's not like you get to run the experiment multiple times and, and, and see all the different permutations of it. Um, that's why I don't like to do big things. But yeah, no, I get it. When I, when I go onto an organization, uh, it goes back to some of the stuff that Joseph was saying, and, and I think Gervais and others. When I go into an organization, I kind of, I, I, I'm a systems guy. And so one of the things that you do in systems is, is I kind of every once in a while poke the system. I, I view it like jello, right? Jello, you poke jello, it kind of wiggles around, right? You poke the system and you see how the system reacts. It's going to tell you a lot about the system. It's going to tell you a lot about the incentives. But you don't want to, you know, you don't want to poke the, the bear too much, you, you, but you want to poke little pieces here and there. And then that's going to tell you what, what the true incentives are. Because everybody, I, I always tell the story. Did anybody ever look up Enron's values? Right? We all got these value statements, right? Here's what we believe in. Here's our values as a, as a company, right? Anybody look up Enron's? I did. They look just like you. Suck. <laughs> no, they're, I mean, their true values suck. But if you look what they put down on paper, same as anybody else. Um, I don't know their if we got val their value statement. Their value statement was awesome. Right. They didn't live them. Exactly. Right. <laughs> right. Because, again, that's the system. There's a difference between what we say and what we do. So how you figure out the system is you poke the system and you figure out, okay, do you really value this? And what do you really value? What do you really incentivize? I mean, a lot of times the, the old example that I see in software development is we incentivize the firefighter. And when you incentivize firefighters, guess what you get? Fires. Fire. You get fire, right? So you have to look at not what they say, but what they actually do, because they're all the same. I, my, my beef is with Wells Fargo. I'll probably never get a job with them, but my beef is with Wells Fargo. Look at their values, but look at how many billions of dollars they've spent not admitting any fault. Oh, my God. You know, because people pay a billion dollar fine because there's nothing wrong. Right. Their values, are the same. they're all the same. But look at the system. Look how the system actually behaves. So, so again, you know, you kind of poke it, and when you poke it, you don't want to do big things. So you do experiments, you do small things, um, and then you see what happens. How does the system respond? And and then that tells you about the system, and then you can go further. So I I did a lot of poking around the the financial uh, incentives early on, which told me that this was the this was the first domino that had to fall. But as I said before, it's the only domino that we really kicked over um, as well as I wanted to. All right, cool. Does anyone else have any questions? Cool. So I'll leave you with my experience in the 60s in San Francisco on LSD. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so... I learned what Larry talked about. Perception is king. Paradigms is king. And your lenses are king. So apparently when you're on this substance, you can see things differently. I, I really liked the, when I moved my hands like this, I could see colors and stuff. It was really cool. So if we can get people in our organizations to see those colors. Yeah, we'll just make them take LSD. Uh, exactly. That's, then that's maybe, maybe we'll be more successful. I don't know. I, that's that's next time. LSD is the key. <laughs> exactly. Steve uh, Jobs Steve Jobs cited LSD. Yes. Well, well Steve was like crazy. So, um, so I want to well, think... I'll just point out that LSD and cross-country skiing means long, slow distance. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, that's a different meaning to me. So, <laughs> so, so I want to. I I really want to thank Larry for coming and expanding our minds. That's why I brought the LSD up because he expanded our minds, and he allowed us to think 
uh, differently and cognitively, right? So I want to thank you, Larry, for doing that. I appreciate uh, it. It's recorded. We're going to put it on our YouTube. I'm going to, of course, put it out there to the universe for people to see and stuff. Um, so looking forward to next. Do we have anything next, uh, Ron? Uh, <laughs> we do. <No. laughs> we do. Yes. Actually, I'm giving a talk. Oh, Ron's giving a talk on what? I'm giving a talk on um, critical agile practices and nuanced te techniques. Oh. Nuances that make the practices that we all think we know so well this much better. But this much better with those practices is that much better in being agile. Oh, so cool. <laughs> I'm going to put uh, a link up because I know uh, Joseph did this, but I have I have Calendly. If anybody would ever want to just talk to me um, about my experience, uh, obviously, oh, cool. and uh, giving me real work for real money uh, or anything of that nature would be great, too. But if you just want to uh, set some time on my calendar, I'd, cer I'd certainly love to talk with you. So I put my Calendly uh, link in there so you can set up a, a half hour Zoom session. Perfect. Thank you, Larry. So okay. and of course the and of course the meetup URL, and we should probably point out the the uh, YouTube URL for yeah. recordings. So uh, hopefully you're seeing those in the chat. Oh, good. Zoom is this new uh, group chat something or other that <laughs> like oh good. Really does work for this group. That's good. All right, so we'll put this uh, we'll put this recording up soon because I'm I'm awful about this, but but Ron and everybody, I'll make sure I'm sound. We'll put this up quickly, and then uh, and then I'll I'll reach out to Larry. I know um, Joseph will too, and uh, we'll try to get you gainfully employed. Well. I appreciate that. I've got a lot of things going on, and uh, I'm still on garden leave, so I've still got a while. So no hurry, but I appreciate um, y'all and, and giving me the opportunity today. Cool. And right. someone, someone pointed out to me that while you can see the URLs, you can't copy them. But, but I think you can click on them and then copy it from the web browser. Oh. Also, if you get... The great Mac utility, if you're on a Mac, uh, Text Sniper. Oh, you could you can copy them. Cool. All right. Highly recommend Text Sniper, and it doesn't. I don't know, ten ten bucks or five or fifteen or something like that, but useful for things like this. Cool. Annoying application um, uh, challenges, like copying URLs that are in pictures. Or uh, <laughs> or slides that are being projected via Zoom. Cool. All right. Hey, thank you all for coming to Enterprise Agile Global Community and for being part of our community tonight. Thank Bye. you.